Chapter 5 Flight into Terra Cognita The museum party, the Doctor, Romana, Nathan, Timmy, Penny and Lou, plus Rongad the Argond, all stared up at the vast spaceship floating over their heads. Their expressions ranged from ambivalence through trepidation to one of delight. This last belonged to the Doctor, of course. The A-36 was essentially already airborne, clearly supporting itself by a mechanism which would no doubt become clear in due course. Its only connection with the ground was via its nose, tethered to the docking tower. This rose over seventy feet above the expansive landing field of Croydon Aerodrome. Tower might have been an overly glamorized name for such a sparse and functional construction, being nothing more than exposed scaffolding forming an elevated lift shaft. The lift provided access to the airship, for passengers and cargo alike. And now, more than ever, airship seemed the appropriate name for this vessel. From the aforementioned nose, the main body expanded backwards like some giant flying courgette. Like a courgette, its circumference was in fact made up of flat sections, in this case of lightweight rigid, or at least semi-rigid material. Along its widest cylindrical midsection, it must have been well over 75 feet in diameter, while the total length from tip to tail surely exceeded 650. Beneath the looming bulk of this vast body hung the ship's gondola, dwarfed by comparison but no mean feat of astronautical construction for all that. It was perhaps just under a third the length of the main body, and occupied that proportion of its underside. To the fore of this dangling addition was the ship's flight deck and other crew stations, taking up the first twenty-five feet. The remaining one hundred and seventy-five feet of gondola was devoted to passenger accommodation and facilities. The entire gondola did not in fact hang down from the vast cigar of the main body on cables like some truly archaic hot air balloon. Instead, it was fared into the larger mass forming a more elegant, streamlined structure, almost like a ship's keel. Attached to this keel at various points via functional frameworks of struts were what looked almost like sizable propeller engines. A more careful examination revealed them to be a slightly more advanced design, something like a turboprop. While a significant improvement on the general early 20th century Earth aesthetic they were still a far cry from rockets or other more space-worthy devices. The final feature of this magnificent ship was far from the least significant. Four giant tail fins ringed the rear of the envelope. Their leading edges swept back, giving the illusion of moving outward slightly, from their forward attachment point to the main body, as that same envelope narrowed in diameter. The edges of the fins were in fact parallel to one another and it was only the dwindling width of the ship that made them appear to expand, all the while simply maintaining the central width of the envelope at around 75 feet. Two were aligned with the ground while the other pair were perpendicular to these like some enormous shark's tail. They all terminated with large ailerons in line with the very tip of the stern. By the time they reached their end, the fins had acquired huge surfaces to aid stability, maneuvering and lift while in atmosphere. The advertising potential of these giant billboards had not been lost on those in power. At the center of each fin was a striking, if derivative, design. A tricolor of concentric circles, red at the center surrounded by white, then blue. Staring out beyond the A-36, it was clear Croydon Aerodrome was a major spaceport. There must have been at least a score more identical masts, most occupied with similar vessels. Many also bore the Imperial Space Service emblem but other planets also flew their colors just as proudly. Another tricolor design of the same colors could be seen on a nearby airship, only this time consisting of vertical stripes covering the entire fin surfaces. The Time Lords guessed it was from Gallia. A little further away they could see a more somber design of a giant black cross on a larger white cross, edged in black, clearly the colors of Germania. The Doctor and Romana were relieved to find this cross devoid of any additional bars at their ends. 
Hopefully this star system was avoiding at least some of Earth's mistakes. Nevertheless, the doctor felt the need to comment. Remarkable how these commercial spacecraft all bear the colors of their more martial cousins. There is clearly a lot of state, or rather states, influence in all this business. A lot of rivalry, no doubt. No wonder they have so many great wars. Romana nodded, but with an impatience which betrayed a different area of interest. No doubt, she concurred, but I'm more interested in how these things ever get above the atmosphere, let alone break orbit. And why so much atmospheric appropriate equipment? By now they had reached the lift at the base of the mooring mast. The Time Lords, the Argond, and the four Albion companions stepped into the spacious metal-framed lift, joining the waiting operator. The lift car seemed excessive for the size of their group, but they knew far more sizable freight often needed loading, the TARDIS for one. The framework nature of both car and mast allowed easy viewing of the airship as they began to ascend. Well, the doctor said briskly, pointing at the craft they were slowly approaching. While much of the basic principles of flight are unchanged from that ancient barrel you saw in the Albion Imperial Museum, there have been many improvements made, both in handling and comfort over the years, particularly in this modern era. Romana raised a skeptical eyebrow at the use of the word modern, but remained silent for the time being to allow the doctor his time to shine. You will observe, he continued cheerfully, that along all the edges running fore to aft, on both the envelope and the underside of the gondola, there are narrow boxes, not much more than a square foot in cross-section. He paused to see if Romana was still listening. Yes, yes, I see them, she said with a measure of feigned indifference, and now you mention it I do recall similar if more bulky boxes on the ancient ship. The doctor snapped his fingers. Exactly. Now, slightly more difficult to make out, you'll see cables running from each end of every box to the one on the opposite side of the same section. There are winching mechanisms inside which allow blinds of caverite painted cloth to be winched out over the surface. Plumber on the reverse, of course, and a further blind painted only with plumber can be winched out to partially or fully cover the caverite as required. In this manner, the direction and strength of thrust can be controlled. Romana frowned. Seems a little Heath Robinson, she observed. Surely you only need the caverite sheets backed by plumber. Here the doctor smiled knowingly, and to Romana's mind irritatingly. He raised a signature finger. Ah, yes, that was how the ancient wooden vessels largely worked, and they were far more prone to problems and failure. Imagine if a caverite sheet got stuck out. Without freeing it, a ship could be stuck with its engines on and little to no means of controlling their flight, hence the plumber blinds as a backup blocking mechanism. Romana continued to frown as she thought about this. Then why bother with the caverite sheets at all? Why not paint the hull with caverite over plumber, then just have plumber painted sheets to control or block the thrust? The doctor chuckled. Again, too risky. The redundancies bring safety, or at least increase it. Imagine if you had a craft in port and one of your plumber sheets blew free in a storm. Suddenly you have uncontrolled and unpredictable thrust from that side and at best a craft careering all over the place. At worst, lost in space. Romana nodded slowly. I see. Yes, upon consideration, their current system does seem a little better, within the overall limitations of the medium, of course. The doctor looked a tad put out. Granted, they are primitive by gut, our standards. But you have to admit they are magnificent vehicles. Rongad chuckled. I can see you're a fan, but I'm kind of surprised you're not just using your own vehicle, rather than shipping it in this one, he said with a grin. Romana stepped in before the doctor could respond. You said you were aware of the state of space-time in this system. Well, it's playing merry hell with the TARDIS right now. Basically, it's grounded. Rongad chuckled again. Oh, I'm sorry you're having trouble getting it up, doctor, he said. And I can quite understand why you'd be interested in these ships to get a lift. The doctor's expression was difficult to read as he studied the Argonde. She will do her part when the time comes, he said quietly and calmly. The discussion was cut short as the lift jerked to a halt. They had arrived at the forward docking port of the A-36. This was formed by a sizable section of the underside of the tip of the nose, which lowered to form a flat walkway into the ship itself. Immediately inside there was evidence of an airlock capability. 
but currently all these airtight doors were wide open to allow ease of access. The doctor and Romana led the way. They were initially following a gantry which ran the entire length of the ship from prow to stern, a vast, cavernous space expanding around them as they walked. At the gantry level, and extending down below it, were wireframe storage compartments full of supplies, luggage, and cargo. The Time Lords thought they could make out a hint of blue somewhere towards the middle of the walkway, and right up against it, the bulk of the TARDIS being stored as close to the ship's center of mass as possible. Their gazes did not linger long on their vessel, though, their eyes drawn upwards to the troubling sight above. Starting about three meters over their heads and almost entirely filling the upper volume of the main body were enormous nets. Those nets contained rank upon rank of giant gas bags, each one about twice the height of a man. They reached all along the side of the hull and almost to the peak of the roof. Only an area as wide as the gantry, about nine feet, was left clear. This gap allowed metal ladders to rise periodically from the gantry to hatches placed along the spine of the ship. Presumably these formed more ports to the exterior of the vessel, most likely used for inspection purposes by the crew. Romana and the doctor's eyes were still fixed on the gas bags. Doctor, Romana hissed, why on Gallifrey have they filled most of the ship with gas? Before the doctor could reply, Lou chipped in. I heard the doctor's description of the ship's operation earlier, but he did leave out an important detail. Another improvement we've made over our ancient Cairo and ancestors is the introduction of lighter-than-air technology. It only really became practically useful in the last 50 years or so, but it forms yet another safety feature. It means we no longer have to depend upon caverite thrust once within atmosphere. Controlling the final stages of a ship's descent via retractable panels alone requires a lot of skill and makes one far more vulnerable to error. Our lighter-than-air technology makes atmospheric travel a far less fraught affair. It even makes leaving a planet a more gentle, pleasant and ultimately safer experience. Romana's face utterly failed to hide her feelings on the subject. So, you crammed your ships full to the gunnels with lighter-than-air gas for safety, she said dubiously. The doctor held up a warning finger, but his lips twitched with amusement. Now, now, Romana, he said in gently warning tones. Let's not be beastly to the Albions. Perhaps fortunately for the doctor, their conversation was interrupted by their arrival at an opening in the gantry, with steep steps leading down. They were by now about a third of the way through the ship, but still a short distance away from where they thought they had glimpsed the TARDIS. However keen they may have been to check on their ship, they felt it was expected that they continue into this one. The steps led into the gondola, ending just after the sealed door to the flight deck and leaving them facing the passenger section corridor. The ship's steward awaited them. Oh, hello, he said breezily. Welcome aboard the A-36 space liner. I do hope you have a lovely stay. Oh, where are my manners? I am Sub-Lieutenant Philip Leslie's, and I am your steward on board this marvelous vessel. I'm sure we'll all get along very well. Sub-Lieutenant Leslie stood there beaming at them. The museum party, plus Rongard behind them, simply stared at him. They all felt there were some important details missing from his introduction. Very well? The doctor asked. Oh yes, very well, Philip responded emphatically, still beaming. The doctor raised a skeptical eyebrow. Really? Shouldn't you be checking our boarding passes and handing out room keys? Philip Leslie's eyes widened, and his mouth fell open as if suddenly hit by a divine revelation. Of course, how silly of me. Crikey, I told you we'd get on very well he exclaimed before extending his hand towards them expectantly. Lou had had the foresight to gather all their papers together, including the doctor's psychic one, and handed them to the steward. Professor Halbert seemed to have assumed the mantle of official expedition leader, a natural assumption given she was the only actual faculty member on the team. The doctor and Romana saw no need to step on her toes, and were relieved that her injured arm was not dampening her spirits. Sub-Lieutenant Leslie's thumbed through their documents with a befuddled expression. Ah, the museum party, he said brightening briefly before confusion reigned once more. Plus one? I'm terribly sorry, but who, might I ask, are you? This last question was directed to Rongad. G'day, mate, he responded cheerfully, proffering his own passport. I'm not with the museum. Rongad of Argonde, independent researcher at your service. Leslie's took the Argonde's paper smiling. 
Then he seemed to be caught by a moment of extreme doubt as he looked between Rongad's document and the other six. The expression then melted away. If it were ever possible to bury only the contents of one's head in the sand, the transformation of the steward's face might well result. He passed back Rongad's passport along with a key, once more smiling broadly. Oh, I say, you do have a very nice room, port side, beyond the dining and observation room. Number six, lovely views from your own porthole, too. En suite facilities to boot. Rongad nodded his thanks and understanding. The doctor, Romana, Lou, Timmy and Penny were all left frowning. Nathan seemed unaffected by or unaware of what was happening, his own thoughts a million miles away. Any chance of our acquiring keys and similar glowing appraisals of our accommodation? The doctor asked politely. Here Philip's face fell. Oh, I'm so sorry, he began, ladling on the sympathy. It seems the Albion Imperial Museum must be working on a budget. They have booked you all into compartments in standard class, this side of the dining room, indeed just here. So, very convenient. He had brightened with this last statement, clearly seeing a way out of some perceived jam. And keys? Romana prompted. Oh, no need for those, Philip said brightly. Your bunk beds are behind these curtains at the side of the corridor right here. A, B and C are all yours. You'll find shared bathing and toiletry cubicles at the end there, just before the observation room. Plenty of luggage space above and below your bunks. Romana opened the curtain of compartment A, which did indeed reveal a modest bunk bed, with a short ladder to the upper mattress, a shelf above that, and drawers below the lower one. The doctor and Nathan looked utterly undisturbed by the facilities. Romana and Lou slightly less pleased. Timmy and Penny looked positively crestfallen. Rongad eased past them all on his way towards his own accommodation in first class. As he passed Romana, he leant towards her. If you grow tired of things here, you're always welcome to visit, he said with a wink. The doctor's head snapped round, suddenly aware of the interaction. Romana smiled sweetly to the Argand. I'll bear that in mind, she said. The doctor remained frowning as Rongad continued on his way. Whatever thought processes were underway were derailed by a brisk clap of the hands from Sub-Lieutenant Leslie's. So, I imagine you'll all want to settle in before departure? Oh, I say, rather. That's only thirty minutes away. Crikey. Well, in that case I'd recommend storing your belongings and finding some nice tables by the windows. You'll get a terrific view of the launch. Well, of the ground, I suppose. Oh, and space, of course. Everyone nodded their understanding, with eyebrows raised and eyes widened by forced politeness. Everyone save Nathan, that was, who remained strangely introverted. Within a minute they had sorted out who was sleeping where. The doctor had offered Romana the top bunk in their compartment, but, much to his barely concealed delight, she elected to take the lower one. Timmy and Penny naturally shared a curtained berth, leaving Lou and Nathan to share the final one allocated to the group. Lou went for the top bunk while Nathan sat staring at his feet on the lower one. He was not allowed to maintain that pose for very long, however, as Lou chivied him and everyone else into the observation area. As advised, they found tables next to one another on the port side up against the windows, the better to watch their departure from Albia and also to discuss future plans. The observation come dining room took up the entire width of the ship, being about nine feet wide at floor level with large windows running along each wall. These windowed walls leaned outwards from the floor, giving the room ever-increasing width towards the ceiling. The center of the room had been left free to provide uncluttered access through the gondola for passengers and crew alike. Drinks were served just as a twin chime came from the intercom. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking, Captain Povey, and I would like to welcome you all aboard the A-36. Now, if you would care to find a suitable seat for your viewing pleasure, we shall get underway. A noticeable thrum ran through the ship as the six turboprop engines roared into life. At the same time, there was a metallic clank as the docking tower attachment released and everyone felt a slight motion in their stomachs as the ship gently began to rise. Once safely clear of the tower, the airship angled upwards for optimal rate of climb. The captain's voice came over the tannoy once more. Well, that was a nicely smooth takeoff. We shall be climbing steadily under buoyancy and engines alone for the next fifty minutes, at which point we shall engage the caverite canopies as we truly pass into terra cognita. Once again, I wish you all a pleasant stay with us. 
and we should be arriving in Gulford Aerodrome on Germania in just under thirty hours. We shall only be stopping there briefly for refueling before continuing on our next leg, bound for Hungaria. So please, do not leave the vessel for sightseeing, or you may well end up on Germania for longer than you had planned. Toodlepip. The museum party remained seated, staring at Albia receding beneath them, ever more of the archipelago of Grand Bretagne being slowly revealed. Penny excused herself for a moment to powder her tiny Albion nose. The doctor examined each of his companions. Timmy and Lou were still staring out of the window with expressions that said they had seen it all before. Nathan stared through the window too, but did not seem focused on any particular thing. Romana, the doctor discovered, was studying him in return. He shot her a quick, and he hoped friendly smile, but had not entirely succeeded in smoothing out his frown. Romana pushed her placemat towards him, tapping a portion of it. The design was a highly stylized and simplified map of the Upsilon Orionis system, with all the major routes of Imperial Space Service flights sketched over the top. Romana was tapping on one planet in particular. I must say I was not expecting that spelling of Hungaria. I thought it would more closely resemble that of Hungary on Earth, she said curiously, still tapping the planet on the placemat. Instead, we have hung as in well hung. As she said this, she glanced fleetingly towards the first-class corridor. Hyphen area, as in the measure of a two-dimensional space. Are we in fact not flying into a culture primarily based on one half of the Austro-Hungarian Empire? The doctor allowed her a slight smile. No, no. It is still based upon the culture, history, and language of Hungary. However, when ancient Kai Rowans first settled on that world, they had something of a problem with large and ferocious carnivores. Fortunately, these beasts were poor climbers, so they developed a unique form of suspended architecture. These days, however, the time of the great beasts is past, and more modern buildings follow a more conventional ground-based pattern. Nevertheless, much of the older suspended architecture still persists to this day. We might even get to see it if we go sightseeing. Romana raised an eyebrow. I hardly think our pursuit of Nugati will allow us the luxury of Hungarian sightseeing. The doctor waggled his head and smiled. I suppose we'll just have to see. At that moment Penny returned and leaned in over the group in conspiratorial fashion. I have just seen a most mysterious figure, she whispered behind her hand. The doctor looked up sharply. Dr. Nugati, he asked quickly. Penny shook her head. Oh, no, I'm not sure I've ever seen him to recognize him. No. As I was returning just now, I could see through the dining area to the corridor at the rear. Just for a moment, I saw a strikingly beautiful woman in a lovely white summer dress going into a cabin there. For the first time, Nathan seemed to recover his senses. His head snapped up to stare at Penny, his eyes wide, mouth agape. For now, no one seemed to notice. That doesn't sound that mysterious, Lou responded dismissively. Ah, Penny said, raising a finger. But... Although I only saw her for a second, I could have sworn she was with child. Not far along, mind you, the bulge was not pronounced, maybe three months or so, but she also appeared to be unaccompanied. Lou maintained a scoffing expression. Really, Penny, is this tittle-tattle your idea of mysterious? A pregnant woman possibly traveling alone? Your attitude is so pre-war, positively pre-encyclopedia. Unaccompanied pregnant ladies are hardly the scandal they once were. And what makes you think she was alone anyway? Did you see inside her room? As Lou had talked, Nathan's expression had shifted, looking at once relieved and yet disappointed. It must have been someone else, he muttered to himself. This time his odd behavior had not gone unnoticed. I'm sorry, Lou said, frowning at him. What do you mean? Nathan looked decidedly shifty, caught off guard. What? Me? Oh, nothing. Um, just thinking of an old case, he explained hurriedly. The doctor studied the shaken Albion for a few seconds, then shook his head. Anyway, fascinating as all this airborne gossip might be, we should address more pressing concerns, namely the whereabouts of Dr. Nugati, presumably aboard, but where, and the location of that sacred scarab. I have little doubt the discovery of one will lead to the other. As the doctor made this announcement, a man seated at the rear most table of the dining area got up seemingly in response to the doctor's words. Romana spotted this movement and tapped the doctor's arm to alert him. 
They both watched as the stranger turned and walked into the corridor to the rear of the gondola. He had only been facing them for a second or two, but it was not just the brevity of their view which left the Time Lord still largely ignorant as to his identity. The man had been dressed in a thick full-length winter coat. Indeed, his entire attire seemed utterly out of season. A heavy woolen scarf hid his neck and the lower half of his face, while an equally warm-looking woolly hat obscured the upper half. The gap between scarf and headgear was barely wide enough for his eyes to peek out. The outfit had been completed with rather rough-looking canvas trousers, heavy boots, and woolen gloves. Not only did his attire seem inappropriate for the weather, but also seemed oddly out of place for anyone staying in first class, which lay in the corridor he had entered. The doctor and Romana exchanged puzzled glances, before shrugging to one another. Mystery upon mystery upon mystery, the doctor muttered to himself, lost in thought. Then he shook himself free from his reverie. So, first things first, if Penny has revealed anything at all, it's that very few of us actually know what Dr. Nugati looks like, which could be a problem. Lou raised a hand, looking smug. I do, she said primly. The doctor chuckled. Bravo. At least one of us will see him coming. I don't suppose you're a good sketch artist by any chance? He asked good-naturedly. Lou actually smiled in response. A rare event indeed. Unfortunately not. I do, however, have this photograph which Sir Arthur gave me before we left, she announced, reaching into her pocket with her left hand and retrieving the item. She placed it on the table before her, and everyone crowded round for a closer look. Dr. Nugati appeared fairly typical for an Albion, save for one important detail. In the picture he was wearing black tails over matching trousers and a high-collared white shirt, complete with a tiny black bow tie. He also wore black gloves which seemed of silk or some similar Albion equivalent. His nose was tiny as expected, his eyes above typically large. The stare he was giving the camera striking, but not perhaps as much as his hair. His neatly separated Albion fronds, slicked back from the temples, were as white as his skin. I've not noticed anybody of your species with hair like that before, Romana noted. The doctor nodded. And so you shouldn't. Our friends here only really range in hair color from light, perhaps sandy, brown to jet black. I've never heard of an Albion looking like this. I have, Nathan chipped in grimly. Everyone turned to stare at him, all equally surprised. Really? gasped Penny. Where? A hint of a twisted smile betrayed the dark humor currently gripping the Albion detective. On corpses, recovered after being buried in certain soils, he reported, staring each of his companions in the eyes in turn. Everyone continued to return his gaze, but no one could find anything to say. Unusually, it was the doctor who broke the mood. Well, would you look at that, he said, pointing out of the window. The curvature of Albia could now be clearly seen. As they watched, they heard the whir of winches, while simultaneously the vibrations from the ship's engines spluttered and died. Instead of beginning to fall, the Imperial Space Service ship, A-36, began to accelerate away from Albia. The Caverite panels had been deployed. The museum party decided to retire for the night and sleep on the ongoing problems of Nugati and the Scarab. Virtually the entire party woke late the next day, even the two Time Lords. The day before had, after all, been an eventful one, and it had clearly taken its toll on everybody. The ship's facilities were not rigidly strict, and so they were able to order breakfast without difficulty once they had emerged from their morning ablutions. Now well-rested and well-fed, they returned their attention to the problem of Nugati. It would really help if we knew which cabin he was in, Timmy stated, a little obviously. The doctor raised an eyebrow at him. It would help if you could find a way to find out, he said sardonically. Then his face brightened and he snapped his fingers. And I think I've just found our source. What the doctor had seen was the steward making one of his regular small talk runs through the dining room, checking that all the passengers were comfortable and happy. This part of his job was clearly very important to him. The doctor waved him over. Why, hello, Sub-Lieutenant Leslie's. Just the man we're looking for. Could we bother you for a second or two? The steward breezed over in an instant, all smiles and smarm. Oh, hello. So delightful to see you all again. It really is no bother at all. Please tell me anything you need and I'd be thrilled to help in any way I can. The doctor smiled to himself, nodding. Both Lou and Romana barely concealed knowing smirks of their own. 
Just what I was hoping to hear, the doctor said, rising to his feet and clapping the Albion officer on the shoulder in a friendly fashion. You see, he continued, we were rather hoping to run into a friend of ours on this flight. He is a keen contributor to the Albion Imperial Museum and has even helped out on some digs. I'm speaking, of course, of Dr. Nugati. Do you know where we might find him? Philip Leslie's smile broadened still further. Why, of course, nothing would make me happier. Dr. Nugati and his manservant are staying in cabin 13, towards the rear of first class. You know, I've not heard a dicky bird from him since we departed, or seen him take any meals in the dining area. If you were to pay him a visit, you might just raise his spirits enough to get him out and about. Oh, I say, what a splendid thing that would be. Oh, I've no doubt he'd be delighted to see us, the doctor agreed before sending him on his way. Now he turned his attention back to the group. I do not think we should just go charging in there, he said, looking pointedly at Timmy. I think we should bide our time just a little, he continued. This evening we shall arrive on Germania. The whole ship will be bustling with activity, and it may not be the best time for potential trouble with Nugati. I suggest we watch the boarding steps, conveniently located right next to our bunks, in the unlikely event that Nugati tries to sneak off the ship. Once we're underway again, it will be late. Nighttime, in fact. When everyone is asleep, say three in the morning. That is when I suggest we make our move. Everyone, even Romana, agreed that the plan was sound. As the ship descended towards Gulfurt Aerodrome, the doctor and Romana sat together in the observation room taking some tea. By a coincidence of interplanetary time zones, it seemed Gulfurt was also in night, much like the A-36, although it was highly unlikely to be the same hour. As they had begun their descent, much of the planet had been visible beyond the Terminator, showing it was quite a different world to Albia. There was a far higher proportion of land to water on Germania for a start. The largest body of water was an equatorial ocean forming a modest blue belt around the world. To the north and south, great land masses stretched to the poles, those most extreme regions white as one might expect. The rest of the land was very green, barring the mountain ranges, and much of it apparently wooded. These lands were run through by numerous vast rivers, many far wider than any found on Earth, for example. For the final part of their journey all was dark, however, save for the lights of villages, towns and cities, and ultimately those of Galfurt Aerodrome itself. The two Time Lords remained at their table as the ship connected to the assigned docking tower, and the hustle and bustle of refueling, loading and a little unloading ensued. The shouts of working Germanians drifted up to them through the night sky. As she listened, Romana began to frown, a frown which only deepened with time. At last she voiced her concern. They're speaking English, she cried, aghast. The doctor's eyes widened in surprise, which was obviously feigned. Really? It sounded a little Germanic to my ears, he said innocently. Romana shook her head. No, not really. There is the odd word in German thrown in here and there, but the rest is entirely English, albeit English in some sort of approximation to a German accent. I assume it's not a very convincing one. The doctor nodded slowly, throwing up his hands and conceding defeat. Yes, yes, you've got me. There's no getting around this. The entire system speaks English in one form or another. The only one which does not is Cairo itself but even then Kai Rowan has only equal standing and usage with English. The Encyclopedia Britannica is as revered there, its place of discovery, as anywhere within the Upsilon Orionis system. They learnt English from the Encyclopedia, and as later waves of their ancient explorers set out to colonise, or in some cases, recolonize the rest of the system they took that language with them, along with slavishly copied versions of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Romana shook her head impatiently. Of course, I understand that. But why are they even trying to sound like Germans or the French, or any other of the countless cultures they appear to be ripping off? The doctor frowned and tutted. Not ripping off. Honoring, he corrected. Most of the groups which settled this system wanted to establish their own distinctive identities. To that end, they often focused on different cultures described in the encyclopedia as the basis of their own. However, the information therein was far from exhaustive, and the linguistic content for other languages was pretty sparse. Hence what you hear around us. Romana rolled her eyes with weary resignation. 
I suppose I should have expected this, she said with a sigh. Then she clapped her hands decisively. Well, we'd best get a couple of hours shut eye before we set out to confront the good doctor. The doctor nodded, smiling gently. An excellent plan. I couldn't have made a better one. Romana snorted. You don't say. It was about two in the morning as Penny emerged from the bathroom cubicle which lay just before the dining area. She was already fully dressed in day clothes. She had reasoned that, having been forced to visit the facilities at this late hour, she might as well dress for their upcoming investigations. There was dim, low-level lighting in both the corridors and the dining area. This illumination was just enough to reveal the figure of the woman in white walking down the first-class corridor away from her. Penny decided to cross the dining area and follow her to see where she went. A blood-curdling scream tore through the ship, waking virtually anyone who was not already awake. The doctor and Romana tumbled out of their bunks, practically running into Lou, Nathan and Timmy in the process. Where's Penny? Timmy asked desperately. Together they all ran aft, charging through the observation area and into the corridor beyond. Here they all skidded to a halt, arrested by the horror before them. Penny! Timmy cried with a pain so deep it sounded as if his soul were being torn from his body. On the floor lay Penny, her throat ripped open, her eyes wide and dead. Standing over her was the figure of a man. His dark clothes revealed no bloodstains in the dim light, and yet they could all see instantly he was her murderer. Rongard burst out from his room a short way behind the figure and stopped dead. Dear God, was all he could find to say about the man towering over the body of poor Penny. He wore heavy worker boots and thick canvas trousers, but these were mostly concealed beneath a long, heavy winter coat. His sizable gloved hands were held out threateningly towards the museum party. A low growl emanated from deep within his chest. On his head sat a woolen hat, and around his neck a scarf of the same material. This scarf had been pulled down to reveal his face. His mouth dripped with that same blood which hung from his pointed teeth and clung to his fur. There could be no mistaking that face, though it had no right to be there. Whoever or whatever was before them may have had the body of a man, but it had the lynx-like head of an Albion cat. Masters, mistresses, the doctor requires materials in order to maintain the TARDIS and ensure continued functionality. He similarly requires carbon-based comestibles to sustain his own biological functions and existence. Master would never say this, but he requires aid beyond that supplied by this unit in order to acquire these. To aid the doctor in his various tasks and creations, this can be most effectively achieved via Patreon or Substack subscriptions, or through donations directly to PayPal. Or if you desire physical goods in return for your contributions, written accounts of my travels with the doctor are also available on Amazon. Links are in the description below. Thank you, masters, mistresses.